Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third session of the Western Cover Crops Council Intermountain Regional Subconference. I'd like to welcome everybody back to those of you who have joined us for the last couple and those who are here for the first time. Uh, today, we're going to take a little bit different take on what we've discussed the last few times, but a few housekeeping things to start with here before we get going. Uh, to start with, you'll notice that uh, in webinar format, your cameras and your mics have been shut off. If you have questions, please feel free to enter those into either the question and answer box or the chat box, and we will get to those um, as we get to the end of our presentations. <clears throat> uh, again, at the end of the day today, there will be a survey on today's session. We would like you to fill out that survey. It helps us evaluate the day's events and helps us to make uh, programming changes for future sub-regional conferences, which are coming in the near future. Um, also, uh, at the end of the program next week, we'll have an additional survey as a follow-up to the pre-survey that you took when you first registered. Um, as, we, as we're getting started today, a little comment on next week's format. Um, due to the difficulty of trying to get people broke out into rooms, what we're going to have to do, we're, we're going to talk about four topics or break everybody up into four topics or groups and uh, a little bit more thoroughly discuss those topics and try to come up with some good programming ideas moving forward that those of us in Extension, NRCS, Soil and Water Conservation, um, and other uh, NGOs and, and groups can start working on to help solve some of the problems of cover crop use and adoption in the West. Those four topics um, are going to be put up on the screen. Jason's going to run a poll and what we would like to have you do is just select which of those you might be interested in most to give us an idea. So if you could just click on, the, on one of those four topics of which ones you might be interested in helping give us some input on, we would appreciate that quickly. Okay, Jason, we have 47 participants. How are we doing on the poll? We currently have 33 responses and it's been going for 45 seconds. So we can probably wrap it up within the next few seconds. Okay, and you'll notice there in the chat box, Jason put in a link. If, if you need to leave early today, go ahead and click on that link and take the survey for the chance to be entered into the drawing for either a gift card or a uh, Managing Cover Crops Profitably book from, uh, from Western Sarah. All right, well, thank you for taking that survey. We hope that you'll join us next week and, and really give us some good input as it, it's really kind of the the capstone event of this uh, four session conference. So with that, our programming today is gonna take a little bit different direction as we look at cover crop and soil health. And we're really looking more into the regenerative agriculture and maybe even what I might call some of the policy related issues to uh, cover crop, soil health and regenerative agriculture. And our first presentation today, carbon markets and policy tools is going to be presented by Colin Mitchell, who is with the sustainable, he's a sustainable ag specialist with NCAT in San Antonio, Texas. Colin Mitchell has a bachelor's in government and a minor in geography and the environment from the University of Texas in Austin. He is a former Permaculture Research Institute of Australia project management intern and a PRI certified permaculture designer. Colin spent the years after his internship working on and managing sustainable agriculture and development projects across Central Texas and the U.S. 
At NCAT, Colin provides free technical assistance to farmers and ranchers through the ATTRA program and works on projects related to soil health, ecosystem services, cover crops, agroforestry, regenerative ag, and more. Welcome, Colin. Hey, thank you, Stephen, and thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you to Lauren, Jason, Western Sarah, Idaho Extension, Oregon State Extension, and um, everyone else attending and for having me. Um, I wish I could be there with y'all in person, but this will have to do for now, and I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pop my screen off just to save us from any uh, Zoom catastrophes, and we'll share my screen. All right. All right, y'all should be able to see my screen now. Um, as Stephen said, my name is Colin Mitchell, and I'm a sustainable ag specialist at uh, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, because that's quite a mouthful. Um, and we're going to be discussing a pretty hot topic in climate mitigation and potential sources of additional farm income um, to pay y'all for that cover crop and uh, use in soil health improvement. And we're going to be looking at carbon markets and other policy tools that pay uh, you, guys, you farmers for those environmental improvements. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to let y'all know a little bit more about our organization, uh, NCAT. Um, again, I work out of the Southwest Office of San Antonio. We cover Texas and the Four Corner regions, and we are an, NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization established in 1976 that has five regional offices across the country, Arkansas, Mississippi, California, New Hampshire, and Texas, with our headquarters in Butte, Montana. Uh, we also have some staff in other states, such as Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Colorado. And we work on issues pertaining to sustainable, sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. Um, ATRA is the program you mentioned earlier. Uh, another long um, kind of mouthful. It's appropriate technology transfer to rural areas. So let's stick with ATRA. Um, and that's our sustainable agriculture program and one of our flagship programs. Um, and it's part of a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Development. And we offer a wide range of services through this program uh, to sustainable ag producers and even non-sustainable ag producers. Um, and we have tons of publications. We have a toll-free helpline. We have webinars, podcasts, um, a YouTube channel. And once I'm done, I will pop a couple of links in the chat because I'm not the best at multitasking right now. And um, please go check it out for yourself on our website, www.atra.incat.org. Um, and also, we have that helpline down there at the bottom. That's our free technical assistance line. And same thing with the email. Give us a ring at 1-800-346-9140 or ask an ag at inca.org. Our phone is always staffed uh, on, during regular business hours. So we're here to help. That's what we do. So I do want to start with kind of just the basics of what ecosystem services are because um, this is what carbon markets and other kind of policies and payment programs will pay farmers for is improving these ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are ecological characteristics, functions, or processes that directly or indirectly contribute to human well being. And ecosystem services are benefits that society derives from these functioning ecosystems. And all of society relies on these ecosystem processes operating the way they're supposed to. And this is true of sustainable agriculture production as well. Um, sustainable agriculture relies on vital, vital ecological interactions. Um, and this slide shows examples of several types of ecosystem services. Uh, and when you read through them, it's apparent that these different services directly or indirectly contribute to our personal and community well-being. Um, and you can see some of these are pollination, water quality, water quantity, uh, carbon sequestration, which is going to be a big topic today, is part of this. Um, and farmers can contribute to this, not just with providing food and fiber, um, but by incorporating things such as cover crops, minimum or no-till, and forest buffers, you know, rotational grazing and things like that. So let's get into the type of payment programs that can exist for you producers that are, you know, taking on cover crops and minimum and no-till. Um, first off is going to be a direct or cost share. And this is really a government organization or another nonprofit or a city government paying you, the farmer, either in full or partly for adopting a uh, practice, basically. Um, and these are going to, you know, do things that are going to protect 
uh, water quality, water qu quantity, improve wildlife habitat, and sequester carbon. Um, next is tax incentive incentives, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, just a little blurb about it. And this um, is basically going to be giving you a tax break. Uh, think about uh, conservation easements. This would fit out our tax incentives, and you get a tax break for conserving land, improving these ecosystem services. Uh, here in Texas, we give um, tax breaks for just ag producers in general, so because you're providing a serv ecosystem service of feeding us. Um, and the only thing I would recommend on that one, if you do pursue an easement and you still want to farm uh, and don't want to take off parts of your farm out of production, uh, there are working land easements out there, so check out those. Uh, next is certification programs. This is one I'm sure you all are familiar, familiar with, uh, organic, real organic, regenerative organic. There's a million of them now. And these are essentially paying you, the farmer, or you're getting, so basically you, the farmer, are going to get paid more for your product and you get to charge a higher price point because you're providing an improvement to the environment through your organic program or whatever. Um, and next is ecosystem service markets. And this one is more unique and it basically is creates a free market-based strategy where the value of these improved ecosystem services is bought and sold through a credit creation program. And we are going to spend most of our time on that one today. Uh, but first, I do want to spend a little more time on direct payments. Uh, this will kind of come up later and you'll, we'll talk about some hybrid, hybrid programs. And with direct payment programs, it involves some version or scenario where the buyer is paying a farmer and ranchers directly for implementing some sort of management practice. And that practice uh, specifics are laid out to describe best management practice that are designed to meet specific environmental protections. Um, in the direct payment programs, you typically have to sign a contract saying that you will adhere to the best management practices and scope and location of work. And in most cases, the environmental improvement will not be measured, uh, which is different than the, in the uh, ecosystem service markets, carbon markets, water quality markets. Um, so this is why a contract is used to ensure these environmental improvements. And one of the most notable direct payment programs are cost share programs from USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS. And I always like to make sure I emphasize uh, these NRCS programs. You know, there's two main types, uh, EQIP or the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And this program provides financial and technical assistance to uh, producers to address natural resource concerns, deliver environmental benefits such as improved water, qual uh, water and air quality, conserved uh, ground and surface water, increasing your soil health, reducing soil erosion, sedimentation. So cover crops, check off a lot of those boxes. Um, and there is a uh, EQIP conservation practice standard uh, for cover crops as well. And the conservation stewardship is the other one, and it helps farmers and ranchers build on existing conservation efforts while strengthening their operations. Um, you know, I typically think it's equipped as new, new practice, uh, CSP as your continuing practice. And both programs typically feature shorter contracts, typically less than five years, and rely on, like I said, those practice standards. Every state has them. If you're interested in getting involved in changing or developing those, um, there are technical committees you can hop on. And I'm on the Urban Ag one here in Texas. Um, it does take a long time to get those changed and amended, though. I did want to just emphasize a uh, different type of direct payment program. You know, none of us are New Yorkers here, but it, I think it's a good example of kind of what can happen with that rural, urban rural interface. And basically, um, the New York City Watershed Agriculture Program was created. Uh, by the New York City uh, Environmental Protection Department. Um, New York City obtains about 90% of its drinking water from reservoirs in the Catskill, Delaware watershed, uh, located more than 100 miles north from the city. The remainder of the water comes from the Croton watershed, which you can see down there at the bottom. And these weather, uh, together, these watersheds cover about 2,000 square miles. And in 1992, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection um, is they manage the city's water supply, developed a partnership with the farming communities in these watersheds. Um, basically, they were going to have to make build this really expensive water treatment plant. And instead of doing that, they decided to pay these farmers and ranchers to implement best management practices that create better water quality. And um, they paid 100% of the cost to create and implement these practices in the Catskill, Delaware watershed. Um, and did a cost share for a lot of them in the current watershed. And as of last, well, that's two years ago now, 2019, um, there was 90% farmer participation, 
Um, they developed 400 whole farm plans, um, and there was 5,000 best management practices, though in some cases they have started buying up easements, uh, especially in riparian areas. So now to move on to ecosystem service markets, which is you know that big um, kind of hot topic that's around now. And these are unique um, because they use free market tools to create a marketplace where ecosystem service credits can be bought or sold. And this you know, area is getting tons of attention right now. And these are unique in that, again, credits are created, valued, and exchanged. You have a buyer, a seller. There's going to be a coordinating organization um, that kind of manages everything. Uh, you will have to define and uh, evaluate detrimental and beneficial environmental impacts. Uh, there's going to be assessment criteria and verification processes, typically by third parties, um, ideally by third parties. And there's going to be a process for determining the value of these credits. So we're going to start with carbon markets. We'll briefly talk about water quality trading markets and then comprehensive markets. And then I'm going to go through some emerging markets and some different soil health policies. And there's some combination of the, all these different programs out there. Um, so with the climate crisis at hand, carbon markets have been receiving lots of attention. You know, I've been working on carbon markets and educating farmers and ranchers on carbon markets kind of since I started with NCAT about three years ago. And I feel like every couple of months I see a new one pop up or is getting developed. And the idea behind this is that farmers like yourselves and specifically y'all with car, um, cover crops and no one minimum till can help mitigate climate change um, by sequestering carbon in soils. And there are types of buyers when it is um, carbon markets um, and different types of programs. The first one is cap and trade. Basically, the government comes in and put a cap on carbon emissions like uh, oil producers, airline company, that. And sorry, it says my. So when they go um, looters or they have to pay tax uh, per the amount they um, expend. The next going to be a voluntary market. Sign up company have internal markets or internal sustainability goals uh, that they want to meet, and so they will voluntarily sign up. Farmers can volunteer and trade markets and voluntary markets if they want to offset their carbon. These credits are sold market and these offsets are just offsetting, which is cap and trade, uh, extra pollution. Um, so Carbon markets, you have uh, California and regional greenhouse gas initiatives, trade markets that exist. 16.75 and Moving on to sources of carbon. Let me check this chat, guys. Sorry, so I had a, a internet for a second. So, yeah, we're we're kind of only getting about every fifth word, Colin. Okay, thank you for. Me, I'm gonna exit out of the screen share, and I have like a dual band internet thing. Let me try the other one. Uh, inconvenience. Switch it now. Okay. Let's see if that works. And feel free to break on in if uh, this happens again. I have another laptop nearby and I can switch to that one. Yeah, that sounds pretty good right now. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. I'm sorry about that, y'all. Um, okay. So back to sources of uh, ways you guys can sequester carbon and farmers can sequester carbon. The main ways that uh, carbon markets are paying out right now, trees. 
um, basically afforestation, not destroying uh, treat areas, or if you're going to plant trees as well, um, or riparian buffers, things like that. Another one is going to be uh, soils. Um, and this is going to be the way y'all with your uh, cover crops, minimum no-till, and improving that soil health is going to be uh, the main way to sequester carbon for row crop farmers. There also is some other programs uh, for methane reduction in rice, and this typically has to do with the timing of the flooding of your fields. Um, but right now, these haven't shown a lot of promise. Um, there was Microsoft bought some credits for some Arkansas rice farmers, and they got about a, enough to buy a cup of coffee. So this isn't a main one right now. So I do want to talk about some issues. Um, you know, a lot of times I see these carbon markets be kind of uh, seen Colin, as the, yep. Can you share screen again? Oh yeah. Uh, sorry about that guys. Yeah, thrown off. All right, y'all didn't miss any slides, so. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for letting me know. Um, so yeah, these carbon market issues, you know, a lot of times I see them in different articles that there's this glowing thing that's going to solve climate change and make all our farmers rich, uh, but they're a lot more nuanced than that. And there's a lot of issues I think that should be discussed. Um, one of them is known as permanent. So with permanent, um, it is a requirement that all the carbon sequestered, whether it's in your trees or soils has to be permanent. And this isn't reflected in a lot of the contracts that are created with landowners participating in these markets. Almost all of these contracts are over 10 years. And with the forced ones, some of them get up to 50 years and over. And permanence creates a problem uh, for those leasing properties and for those that may not pass down their land. It also permanence is an issue because of occurrences of fires and floods that may destroy carbon stocks and soils and trees, which will increase with global warming. It's also important to understand your liability if these things are destroyed. Um, do you have to pay everything back if fire rips through your property and then you get a flash flood washing a lot of your soil uh, way that you've built up over the past, you know, six, seven years of being really on the ball with your cover crop practice and your minimum no-till? Um, another issue is going to be additionality. And this means that the carbon must be new. And farmers and ranchers or farmers like yourselves that have been already sequestering carbon and building up your soil health, uh, you won't be eligible for payments. So any of the work you've done in the past, uh, you will not get paid for that carbon that you already sequestered. You know, I know a rancher here in Texas took his soil organic matter from 2% to 6% over about 10 years, and he will not get paid for any of that if he signed up for a carbon market. And this also means additionality that you can't be involved in multiple carbon markets at the same time. Typically, a lot of them make you sign a non-compete clause. And another issue is going to be around um, measurement uncertainty. Uncertainty, And depending on what time of year, you know, you can take soil samples, the bulk density, the organic matter, which are two of the major measurement standards, may be different. Um, summertime versus wintertime will look a lot different. Um, there's also an issue with testing depth. Are soil samples being taken at six inches, 12 inches, or soil samples being taken to a few feet as a soil core? Um, often, so, uh, carbon is sequestered in deeper soil profiles. Um, increasingly, remote sensing and models are being used to generate values of carbon sequestration on farms, and models such as Comet Farm from NRCS uh, would only provide estimates that likely won't be accurate enough for a carbon market. Um, Remote sensing is using biometrics taken from satellites that are often ground truth, the soil samples, and other measurements. And remote sensing has issues with modeling errors and can rely on extrapolating assumptions from a smaller area to larger swaths of land to calculate whole farm carbon sequestration that could also lead to inaccuracies. Um, geography is also an issue um, on farm and nationally. You know, a slope will have different carbon sequestration potential than a flat in a valley. And even different pastures or fields will have different levels of sequestered carbon. And I think there's also something to be said for comparing carbon sequestration potential between, you know, y'all in the Intermountain West, the arid parts of the West versus folks in maybe the coastal Oregon, Washington area or the Northeast. Um, it does take much longer to sequester carbon in drier areas, um, especially if you're doing dry land farming um, than in, you know, wetter more temperate, less volatile areas of the country. 
Um, I know the Intermountain Mountain West can get pretty dry. Um, you, you, you all rely on snow quite a bit, and I've been up there in the summer times and seen the how arid it can be similar to here in Texas. Um, another issue is going to be uh, environmental justice, and you know this has to do with those offset markets. So, is a company just paying uh, farmers in rural areas to improve land, but they're going to pollute a city or a low-income neighborhood and cause a lot of uh, destruction and pollution somewhere else? And lastly, is greenwashing, and this is essentially companies putting a spin on these agriculture-based carbon markets, and they're slapping the brand on the initiative, calling it a day, and um, not really getting the job done and patting themselves on the back. Um, that is, the, you know, basically falling into a marketing trap with some of these carbon markets. So water quality trading, um, just real quick, is going to be similar to carbon markets, but they are cap and trade markets and they're voluntary, voluntary ones. Uh, with capped markets, uh, the authority typically comes from the Clean Water Act or your state governments, and they put a limit on temperature, sediment, or pollutants like nitrogen and phosphate and larger larger bodies of water like uh, rivers and lakes. And this pollution cap is often referred to as a total maximum daily load or TMDL. And it comes in two uh, forms, point source pollution, which is like from a pipe or a ditch and non-point source pollution. So that's like fertilizer running off your farm and into a stream. Um, point source polluters could be a large corporation or even like a port authority. A port authority. And um, two examples of this are going to be like the Chesapeake Bay Water Quality Trading Program. And there was one in Ohio called the Great Miami River Watershed Water Quality Trading Program. And the idea behind this is basically that it's a lot cheaper to pay farmers and ranchers to change their practices to reduce nutrient loads on bodies of water than to build these super expensive filtration plants. Uh, in the case of the Chesapeake Bay, farmers and ranchers in Maryland and Virginia Two of the largest polluting states were able to receive technical assistance and peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities through private funding uh, from folks like Lockheed Martin in Port of Virginia. And these farmers uh, actually had TMDL limits themselves, but were allowed to sell extra credits they generated. Uh, and I do want to point out that y'all in Idaho have a bill coming up this session uh, that would allow your Department of Environmental Quality to create a voluntary water quality trading mar markets. And if anyone's from Oregon, um, Y'all have water quality trading markets up there as well. So these bundled and stacked markets um, are really kind of a combination between, you know, conserving wildlife, water quality and quantity, and carbon. Um, and you're able to get multiple payments from multiple ecosystem services. And this is really a bigger reflection of the work you would be doing in a regenerative agriculture setting or if you're planting cover crops and reducing tillage. Uh, you're not just sequestering carbon, you're likely doing multiple of these things. And it is a more holistic approach and can likely get more smaller farmer involvement. And now I, we're going to move on to talking about some of these emerging markets. We're going to cover three, and those are the kind of the big three that you see around quite a bit. There are other ones in development, um, but we're going to focus on these. And the first one is the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium. This one is a nonprofit. Um, they are focused on carbon initially, but are looking to add water quality trading, water, uh, water quantity, and some wildlife protection credits as well. Um, as you can see from the map, they are doing multiple pro pilot projects all over the country, including one in Oregon. That one is focused on grazing right now, um, but if you're interested in what they're doing, it's worth uh, giving them a call. Um, I know they're going to be expanding and doing lots more pilot projects, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do one focused on uh, row crops in y'all's area. Um, <coughs> right now, they're doing all these pilots because they're trying to have site-specific um, verification and evaluation protocols, and um, because soils in the Northwest are different than the Great Plains, and so are uh, conditions and things like that. There are a lot of major players involved with this one, this one like McDonald's, Carville, uh, Cargill, Nature Conservancy, National Fish and Wildlife, and tons of trade associations. There's like 40 people on their website uh, that are involved with this. And they're not going to start uh, selling credits until 2022. Um, it, it was originally 2020. I've seen them push it back slowly, but it, I think it's largely because they are doing all these trials in my conversations with folks that work there. Um, they're trying to die on the science to create a measurement and verification protocol and tools that are site-specific cost-effective and accurate using soil testing and geospatial information from satellites. Um, 
yeah, they're doing lots of R&D on this one. So next is Indigo Ag, and this one um, may pique y'all's interest. It is only for crop producers, and you can get paid for adding cover crops, uh, either for the first time, extending their your duration, or diversifying your mix, diversifying your crop rotation, or reducing or eliminating tillage, or reducing fertilizer by reducing your nitrogen inputs or switching to injection. Um, Indigo collects data directly from growers and the equipment that they use to model the carbon levels within their soil. Um, Indigo gathers as much data as they can through like kind of scalable passive methods, such as that satellite imagery to see what your covers look like at different point, parts of the year and to assess how farm management practices have changed over time. Uh, Indigo soil samples a representative subset of fields to ensure the accuracy of their carbon quantification. Uh, the minimum for Indigo last time I heard was 300 acres. Uh, so this is actually the lowest you'll see in uh, the three that we're talking about. Uh, the Ecosystem Service Mar Market Consortium doesn't have uh, a lower limit yet. Um, farmers are required to submit three to five years of historical as well as current season details about planting and harvest dates, fertilizer types, amounts, application dates, tillage types, uh, and dates, and also information on cover crop types, dates, planting, termination methods, and organic amendments if you applied them. Um, you will get paid according to how much carbon you have in your soil. In 2020, they were guaranteeing $10 per credit, um, you know, per ton, and more if it goes up. Uh, since 2020 is now over, I'm not sure if that $10 minimum is still holding. Um, I haven't caught any of the web webinars. They do pretty regularly uh, in the new year. Um, it does take about 12 months to be issued a credit from sign up. And Indigo also is providing agronomic support. Uh, they will try to sell you some microbial seed treatments. They're a big uh, agribusiness company and other uh, resources through Indigo Acres, such as access to their free software platform. Uh, the third one we're going to discuss is Nori. And they use these Nori carbon removal tons, which is equal to one ton of carbon. And you will be required to pay taxes uh, on these. I'm not sure about Indigo right now. There's been talk about them trying to get you a tax credit, but I'm not sure how they're going to pull that off. Um, Nori allows you to sell up to five years um, of carbon removal from previous years. So that's that additionality thing. But that ended in 2020. So you won't be able to get back pay if you sign up for this one unless they change that. Um, I'm not sure if they will, con you know, they'll continue it or not. They said they wouldn't, but we'll see. Um, Nori uses blockchain technology that allows a secure data transfer. Uh, you can join if you've adopted those carbon sequestering practices in the last 10 years. And this is for farms, a thousand acres and up. Um, you'll run your records through a model to estimate your carbon sequestration potential. This is that NRCS Comet Farm, which is a whole farm carbon planning tool from NRCS, and they'll provide you a projected revenue. Uh, so contract obligations, uh, you will have to submit annual activity practice updates. Uh, you're on a 10-year contract. You sign a non-compete clause. You can't be in any other carbon markets. And um, you are locked into the practices you sign up for and commit to. Um, verification by Nori, so those soil samplings, um, are, can cost, uh, in signing up, can cost anywhere from three to $5,000. Um, and then a two-year rolling estimate of changes in soil organic matter is determined via that comet farm, and you will be audited after that 10 years to confirm that. Um, Nori sells their credits for $15 per ton, and you also get this Nori token, which is a cryptocurrency that will fluctuate in cost. Um, both suppliers and Nori uh, share in this risk if the computer model isn't accurate, or again, your uh, you change practices or something happens to your farm, like it all burns. Um, and they use these kind of like those cryptocurrency tokens held in reserve to automatically purchase new um, NRTs or carbon credits on behalf of the buyer and the amount of any overreported carbon or leakage from change practices. So I did want to just pop this um, map up as well. There's other programs out there besides these carbon markets. A lot of states are moving towards soil health legislation to provide um, grants and things like that for people that are adopting soil health practices like cover crops and changing tillage. Uh, California has one and they're working on ones in a lot of y'all states. So, you know, keep in touch with those. I'm sure y'all have great legislative advocacy people in y'all's area. And also I recommend everyone uh, 
keeping in touch with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, they're always got their finger on the pulse, at least with federal policy. And they may uh, have some things for states as well. I do want to mention this program, which is the California Healthy Soils Program, because I think it's a unique combination of carbon markets and direct payments to farmers. Uh, it is legislation that was passed by the California government. It receives um, funding from their greenhouse gas reduction fund, which is essentially their cap and trade program. Uh, the legislator, legislature put some money towards it. And also there was a, a bond proposition 68. So voters actually put some money uh, towards it as well. And this one actually uh, provides farmers and ranchers with direct grants. So you put an application in for some sort of sustainable ag uh, project that you'd like to do. So you want to start planting cover crops, you want to start uh, reducing your tillage, you want to buy some equipment, you'll submit a grant and they'll uh, choose whether you can accept it or not. Um, and since 2017, they have allocated $42.8 million to farmers and ranchers through these grants. So that's pretty great. And if you're in California and you're on this, 2021 applications are coming up in February. And just I want to mention two pieces of federal legislation that everyone should kind of keep their eye on. Uh, one is the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Uh, this one is going to allow the USDA to verify and authorize um, carbon market verifiers and technical assistance providers to help you sequester carbon. Has really good bipartisan support. Um, it's in the House and the Senate. I have a feeling this one's going to get passed, <coughs> but we'll see. You never know. Um, the other one is the Agriculture Resilience Act. This one focuses less on uh, carbon markets and is really focused around improving soil health. And it would create a new soil health grant program for state and tribal governments. It would authorize the USDA to offer performance-based crop insurance discounts for practices that reduce risk, expand the National Agroforestry Center. It's going to ideally expand uh, CSP and EQIP. And um, it's going to be, let's vote, you know, other those other ways we talked about to get y'all paid for the soil health practices y'all are doing. Um, so lastly, I just want to kind of go over some considerations that I always recommend to farmers and ranchers take a look at before applying to these programs. Uh, one is to look at the program stability. Um, you know, there was a failed climate program, the Chicago Climate Exchange. Uh, in the past, I think of looking how long it exists, uh, how many people are involved, what sort of funding sources they have is a good idea. Uh, clarity of required practices and verification processes. Uh, know what is required of you, when, when are they going to test, how are they going to test, how much is it going to cost, um, which brings us to cost transparency. I think really going through that contract, seeing when you're going to get paid, how you're going to get paid, what's going to cost you other grants or gap loans to help you get new equipment and things like that. Um, practice implementation or environmental improvement. Is, are you are they measuring something? Or are they going to pay you directly for a practice? Um, and with anything, what is going to be a return on your investment? Again, I think almost plugging carbon markets into like your normal uh, business planning and things like that is a good idea if you're interested in them. Uh, because the thing with carbon markets or some of these other programs, they're not going to pay you uh, pay for you to get new equipment or adopt the practice if it's a ecosystem service market. Um, another one is going to be length of until you return. Is it going to take you five years to get paid? Is it going to take you 10 years? Uh, some of this has to do with the rate that you can sequester carbon. Uh, another one is going to be aggregation. So you saw some of these uh, start at 1,000 acres. Um, you know, you may be able to get more bang for your buck if you're a smaller farmer and you can team up with, you know, other farmers in your watershed or your neighbor and you can aggregate a lot of these uh, payments. Almost like a co-op system. Um, I did want to share some resources on our website. Uh, we have a payment for ecosystem service publication that goes a little bit more in depth to some of these. Um, there's also, we also have tons of podcasts, including one with uh, Jeannie Merrill from uh, CalCan on that uh, California Healthy Soils Bill and other programs they have for uh, ecosystem services there in California. And then we have some taped webinars. One is with uh, Debbie Reed, actually, of the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium and Jim Blackburn out of Rice University in Texas. Uh, his work there in developing a carbon market in Texas and a national soil carbon sequestration verification standard. And lastly, there's my email. Please email me anytime. We're here to help. Um, that's what we do. So please feel free to reach out. And thank you. All right, thanks, Colin.
Appreciate it. Well, there's a lot of information there quick. It's a good thing we're not having a test. <laughs> um, if you have questions for Colin, you can type those in the question and answer. Uh, Colin, in the chat box about timestamp 1223, I did see a couple of questions come up if you want to look at those and okay. uh, answer, answer folks there. And then after we're done today, there will also be a chance to type in some questions. But if you'd like to ask Colin something, you can go ahead and put that in the question and answer box and he can answer those immediately for you. All right, our next presentation this afternoon is uh, building a regenerative agriculture economy through regenerative agriculture validation tools. Our presenter for that presentation is Nick Honinger, who serves as a general manager of Pasture Map, a web and mobile application that enables better grazing management decisions so ranchers get the most from their land. He also serves as an associate at SoilWorks Natural Capital, where he helps source companies disrupting the world of regenerative agriculture. So Nick, welcome. Hey everybody. And thanks again for having me, super excited to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick and get started. Right. Sorry, moving this box out of the way. <laughs> Uh, well, great. Uh, well, thanks again for having me. Um, my name is Nick Honiger. I serve as the GMS pa Pasture Map, and I'm an associate over at SolarWorks Natural Capital, which is a relatively new regenerative agriculture focused fund. Uh, we're based out of San Antonio, Texas. And I thought the best way to go about talking about how uh, to build a regenerative agriculture economy through regen agriculture validation tools is to actually tell the story of uh, how SolarWorks acquired our first validation tool, uh, which was Pasture Map talk about why we invested in that and some of the kind of future investments in that technology and how that's going to help kind of shape the ecosystem of overall regenerative validation. So with that, uh, let's first talk about SoilWorks. Uh, so our mission is to accelerate the transition of regenerative agriculture. Um, and there's a lot of similar funds out there that are all focused on this idea of actually pushing regen forward. Um, so what that means for us is we break it down into a couple of categories. Uh, one is the farmer itself, consumers, and also consumer brands. Uh, I think the one kind of key area of focus that I'll talk on uh, quite a bit through my kind of discussion of, of SolarWorks and our fund is there's a lot of investment happening right now um, at the rancher level where it's either incentives through things like the carbon market or ways to kind of change the supply chain through processing plants. Uh, but one thing that we're trying to do and also kind of encourage ranchers to do as well is look at the end consumer where if we can't generate the demand and drive that kind of education on why people should pursue regenerative it's not going to kind of overall create that movement right if one wants to buy regenerative products it's going to kind of <laughs> make that very short-sighted in the sense that you have to convince consumers to also take that leap of faith so that's kind of how our portfolio functions and our goal is that by all of those things together we can accelerate the transition to regenerative agriculture by creating consumer demand for it and building a supply chain to also fulfill that demand. Uh, and then part of fulfilling that demand is actually proving uh, and validating regenerative itself. Um, so this is kind of a, an infographic that we use to kind of showcase our focus and what we think you have to do in order to, to truly invest in a regenerative economy, right? It's, it's broken down into those three core pieces where it's new tools and software, it's supply chains, and also consumer brands. Um, so the principles that, that we operate under is everything has to be kind of driven toward better and healthier food. It's got to restore plant and animal diversity. It has to regenerate the soil to store water and carbon. And the end goal is more profitable family farms. I think one of the, the key pieces when, at least for us, when we're looking at how are we growing the regenerative economy, it can't be focused on, you know, great, we got some technology companies to make a ton of money or some carbon markets really took off if the ranchers don't actually get rewarded from it. Uh, I think that's the key piece of that movement is we have to ensure the ranchers who are actually making these changes get rewarded for those so they can be sustainable. So kind of the leading indicator of success for everything we look at and a lot of the kind of validation tools is the actual number of regenerative acres that we can help create as an organization and anything we invest in has that same kind of mindset. Um, 
So that's a super, super high level kind of overview of, of why Passion Map came to be. Um, I thought that would provide some basic context. And now we'll get into the fun side, which is the actual validation piece uh, and spend a little bit more time here. I think Passion Map will be a lot more interesting just because uh, A, uh, it is for ranchers and kind of by ranchers. So the focus of this is how do we create a standard for rotational and regenerative grazing? Because there's a lot of kind of debate within both, both our internal team and also kind of around the world of what does it actually mean to be regenerative and, and can you kind of assign values to that? So our goal is to invest in a technology that we think can help kind of validate the efforts of ranchers around the globe. So quick overview of the pasture map is the thought process behind it is their current system is broken. I'm sure a lot of folks on the call who are kind of interested and excited about regenerative have seen these numbers before, but the idea is small ranchers are at risk of going extinct in terms of just a massive amount of increase in bankruptcies. And there's a crowded and stressed cattle market and there's lower quality meat being produced. Ranchers are getting dependent on subsidies uh, and just kind of other very expensive ways to augment their production. Uh, and there's a concentration of manure and feedlots that are just overall not the best for the planet. So we, we recognize, and there's a lot of folks that say, hey, we, we know our system is broken now, but if we're gonna make those changes, you know, how do we go about that? I think there's a lot of talk in the industry around like why regenerative and rotational practices are better and how they have certain improvements, but there's not necessarily a guide or a first step of, okay, great, you've been doing it this way for you know, 100 years or more in some cases, depending on where the ranch is located, you know, how do I make that first step to go towards regenerative? Right. So we see rotational grazing as, as a key and the solution to this. Um, I'm going to skip to this side quickly because I'm sure <laughs> most folks on the call recognize why rotational is different. But the, but the goal and the core of what rotational means is you're moving or rotating your livestock to different pastures and paddocks every set number of days. So it's a lot more kind of difficult than your traditional uh, conventional ranching, if you will. Um, but it has a, a robust list of benefits in terms of both food quality quality of land and of creating carbon credits. Um, so just overall a great, you know, process to have. Uh, the downside of this is that grazing management is, is a critical piece to rotational um, grazing, but it is extremely difficult. Um, and we see this time and time again with ranchers who engage both pasture map or engagements we have at the fund uh, is that we were trying to grow this regenerative economy kind of validated out. Um, and we'll say, okay, you know, what's your grazing plan? Can we showcase what you're doing? And a lot of folks have massive binders or whiteboards all across their offices. Of, you know, here's our, here's our plans and there's, it's crossed out a thousand times because it, it may rain one day and that changes your, you know, your grazing plan or it may, uh, you might split your paddock differently or the grass isn't growing back as fast. And there's all these different variables that I think get, you know, very oversimplified when folks say, hey, you know, we'll just let's go move to regenerative. And they don't realize this the mass amount of work um, that's so critical to rotational grazing. So our kind of mindset and how we approach this as a validation tool is not only do you have to validate the practices, you have to, in some sense, make at least the, the management part of it significantly easier on the rancher because you can't just say, have all these extremely robust records and anytime any kind of weather variable changes, you know, at some point it's, it's not going to get updated. There's just too much going on. So that's, I think the, the first key piece of validation is how do you make, you know, the management tool itself uh, just happen easier, right? So that's the goal of pasture map uh, is a, you validate um, through very easy kind of grazing management um, record keeping. Um, and there's a lot of other kind of awesome tools out there. I'm going to use pasture map as kind of my, for example, with some of the screenshots, uh, but but Farm OS from Open Team and My Grazing um, also have kind of grazing management tools. Uh, by no means do so I want you to think I'm <laughs> pitching our tool particular here, but I think that's what just from an investment standpoint and an economy building standpoint is that's what you want to look at is how do you actually drive towards you know simplified record keeping um, and, and keep that in mind as you're, as you're seeing tools and say, okay, step one for validation is actually showing what's happened, where has cattle moved, how has it changed my land uh, to drive those kind of ecosystem changes. So I think that the way you do that is you find technologies that track things like rest days, animal days per acre, grazing days, forage capacity, ranch infrastructure, and all those key variables that will Kind of do two things. One, it will show what ranchers have been doing and where the animals have been. 
and two, it will validate the changes in the land. So I think a lot of folks now with the cover markets being so robust and all the great information we just heard from the prior talk, it's that is one piece of it, right? It's, it's has the land sequestered more carbon, but the other piece of it is you should be able to see benefits as a rancher in terms of you're getting you know, more from your land. The grass should be healthier. Your forage capacity should increase. And um, so what we found is by investing in tools that simply put a layer of data on top of that to show and, and augment what you've been up to that reinforces what you're doing. So you can prove to folks, no, not only do I know my, you know, beef is better quality, I can show you how I've improved my land over time through historical changes in my forage capacity, or I could graze this land harder and I can back that up with data. And I think that's the critical piece here is being able to show a historical record of how your land has improved over time and time uh, or season and season. So another thing that we think is, is super important in terms of kind of validation of regenerative efforts is kind of showing and managing future and historical moves or, or forecasting data. So again, this can be done in a variety of, of different platforms. I'm, I'm showing the, the passion map example of this just because it's who I work with. Um, but the goal is for current uh, record keeping and planning, what we found from a lot of ranchers is it gets difficult to show, you know, okay, what piece of land are my cattle going to go graze on? You know, what are the impacts of that? So what we are looking for in terms of what we're trying to validate that is, can you forecast that out and then predict how it will impact your land? And obviously if you pull in rain data and prior history, it's not perfect or 100% accurate all the time, but it gives you that ability to say, okay, here's at least what my set plan was, here's what happened, and then here's my future moves and what my land should produce. And it lets you make just smarter decisions as a rancher so then, okay, well, if my predictions are, are correct, then I can go get, you know, a hundred more head of cattle to run on this land, right? And obviously that's, I'm making up numbers here, but we get stories all the time. And I think one of my kind of metrics of success to say, okay, how do we really know we're validating the efforts of regenerative ranchers and kind of encouraging them to invest in that opportunity is we'll have folks that use forecasting tools based off of that historical, you know, they look at their prior season, they take all those data reports uh, that we provide and say, okay, based off of this, if I can graze my land a little bit harder and hit this you know, paddock maybe a little more, it'll grow back just based off rainfall data I've got, it will you know, really save 60,000 to 100,000 in food cost. And granted, that's, <laughs> those are the big numbers that we love to hear, but that's not obviously every single time, but those are the stories I think that get us most excited. And I, and I think the point I'm trying to make here is a lot of this data can be captured now from ranchers. So if you say, I'm sure a lot of folks on the call even are saying, look, you know, I've got a bunch of historical records. I could probably pull weather records too. And I think the goal of, of technologies when it comes to validation isn't to replace rancher decision-making at all, right? It's to say, look, you already have a thousand things to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. So can we pull all that data for you to validate your efforts kind of in a, in a quicker and kind of data backed way where it's rather than you having to go check rainfall gauges and see where your herds were, can we pull all that data for you? So all you have to focus on is getting your cows to move around, which is way harder said than done anywho. Um, and then all the data side of that to prove what you've been moving and prove the impacts to your land is done for you. All right, so here's how that looks from a record keeping standpoint, right? It's, we want ranchers to kind of validate their land through it shows acres, perimeter, grazable acres, you know, what on your land can actually be grazed, what was grazed this season. And this all goes back to, let's say you're gonna go, you know, be it sell your property or make estimates for next year. You can take records and say, okay, here's how I validate my efforts. Um, I have seen what's grazable. I know how much grazable land comes out of this. It pulls in things like NRCS estimates to layer on top of that. And, and that in, in my mind and in, in the fund's mind is, is really the, the future in terms of growing the regenerative economy is you invest in tools that say, it's not just what the rancher is doing, it's can you incorporate, you know, what does NRCS suggest? What is, what does the NOAA satellite data say on what this land should produce? So that way the rancher A is creating the most amount of kind of profit if they can per acre. Um, and they've got the data to back up their choices. So if they're gonna go to the bank to get a loan or get 
kind of make insurance claims or what have you, they can say, look, I've got detailed records per pasture that show what I've been doing and can produce on my land to help kind of augment any of the, I'd say the scary side of switching to regenerative. Because a lot of times what we find is folks lose, uh, they could, if they lose a certain type of insurance that they've got, because they're switching to farming practices, we want them to be able to be backed up by data. So, you know, here's why it's better. I can prove it. Um, and that's the key, because if they can't finance it, then it's not going to be sustainable long term. Uh, and then the other thing we think is, is super critical to kind of validating um, from an investment side is actual old school photos of, you know, how has pasture health changed over time? Um, so there's a couple of really cool tools out there um, that do anything from augment this with satellite data to photos just from your phone. Um, so I threw in some kind of a variety of examples here, but uh, this is only going to get more advanced in terms of a validation standpoint. Um, I've got another slide coming up that shows how, how satellite imagery is really changing this, but uh, you'd be surprised on how much you can get from just having imagery tied to cattle movements, right? So you can say, hey, if I've had X head or herd for X amount of days, um, after 20 rest days, what does that grass look like? And how can I prove that? And it's all about, okay, I can take those photos now and validate based off my moves. So when I go to my planning for next season, or if I want to kind of forecast other seasons out, I can see historically how that grass performs. And then again, it all comes back to how you tie that back to other sources of data. So is it because you had extra rainfall? Were you in drought? Uh, so the trick for validation is just having that all in one place. Um, the other thing too that is super critical, and this was kind of what I alluded to earlier in the presentation is kind of generating grazing records, right? Where it shouldn't be a super tedious process for ranchers to have to edit and kind of change their movements uh, constantly. So the goal for true validation in my kind of mind is you should be able to set your grazing plan. And then based off of all of the kind of data you've got in animal health, it, you can easily audit and view your historical and current grazing plans and the impact that has had on your overall production in terms of acres and kind of animal weights and AUD changes uh, and, and that, at the end of the day, right, if you have all your records in one spot, you kind of export this report of, okay, here's everything I did this season, here's all of the rain, here's all of the, you know, grass changes, forage changes, animal weight changes, um, I can show you exactly where my cattle went over time, um, and then that, in my mind, is, is truly validated regenerative, right, you've got from where this cap started, to where it ended, every single move it's made. You've got every piece of weather data tied to that. You've got soil data changes tied to that. And it's all mapped in one spot and all on one recorded report. Um, and that is how, in my mind, as you get all that data captured in one place, you can truly be a validated uh, kind of source of regenerative, right? So kind of to summarize that, it's it's kind of our end goal as both a fund and a company. And there's a whole bunch of other folks doing similar stuff that we're working with on open team that are kind of in the same mindset, right? Is to truly validate your efforts. You need historical data for all your herds. You need photos and grazing history saved directly to the pasture. And you need rest history automatically calculated and visualized to ensure soil health. And then the stuff that we're super excited about uh, from an investment standpoint, and also just that's coming down the pipeline is satellite imagery and having a lot more soil data tied back to pastures. Um, so the, the downside of some of the stuff right now, especially with soil test data, uh, capturing things like bulk density changes and doing combustion testing, it's relatively expensive and extremely expensive depending on the size of your operation. And I'm sure I'm <laughs> preaching to the choir here and saying soil tests can get kind of out of hand and expensive, right? Everybody wish they could do soil tests, um, but if you could do them at the click of a button, we're spending days and days on end, kind of going out and, and digging trenches, you know, sure, it's, it's way easier said than done. Um, so the things that we're excited about from a validation standpoint, and then I think that's, that's coming down the pipeline that's gonna be really exciting, um, is that folks are using kind of LIDAR, which is a, a type of satellite technology and a few other satellite technologies to say, look, we can see the bulk density changes over time in certain parts of your, your land, right? Because they scan your ranch essentially and spit out this little kind of satellite image I have here in the top right. And they can tell you, hey, we're, you know, 
80% sure that here is the kind of carbon change in your soil uh, over the past you know, year of grazing. And you tie that to your grazing records to make sure, okay, well, I, I moved my cattle around or my animals around, so that seems to make sense. And say, okay, well, if, if you did all of that, you should be able to go take these kind of eight soil samples. Um, and I'm making up numbers here, but let's say you normally do 50. The goal is, well, what if you could do 10 leveraging satellite data and still get the same kind of validated efforts where it's, you can prove how much carbon you've sequestered, but it's way more cost effective. Um, and a lot of this technology is emerging now. There's a really cool group in Australia right now called Farm Labs that's doing something relatively similar to this. Their, their end goal, which I think is, is super exciting, is to avoid testing entirely. Um, I, think, I think that's a, a, a lofty kind of crazy goal, but if they can achieve it, like that would be phenomenal from a ranching standpoint, because instead of having to go test the stuff yourself, you just kind of scan and forget, if you will. But, but the goal here and how this all ties back to validation is you can have as many kind of animal records and grazing plants as you want. Um, and you can kind of show where be it cattle or whatever you're grazing has moved over time and the impact it has, it, has it had on the land. Um, but we haven't found a way as of yet to get around the soil test at the end of the day. Like that's, that's the true kind of meat and potatoes if you will uh, to validate, you know, okay, you've got the records, you've shown where stuff has moved. We've got the science behind it to say it should be doing stuff that's better for the soil. It should be capturing more water. It should sequester carbon. But how do you truly prove that? Uh, so what we've been doing is working with folks at Open Team and a few other organizations to say, okay, if we can take all of your records and then do the soil testing aspects to that, you know, that's how we can say this is a truly a source of validation, right? It's, it's soil data plus herd data kind of layered onto one. Um, and that's what we, I think, in terms of be it investment or what we see as validation tool sets, uh, is that, that ultimate combo, if you will. Um, so then, so what's next for, I think, kind of A, validation as a whole and kind of what we're looking at from, if I were to, you know, investments and what have you in the kind of regenerative ecosystem and, and validation uh, kind of space. Uh, so. I would say passion rep certified here, but I think it's it's this like goal of how do you certify something as rotational or regenerative? And we're working with a few groups now that are trying to put kind of a regenerative label, be it on, on their beef or or what have you. Um, and what we found is, is kind of interesting in that um, there's a lot of debate on you know what it actually means to be be anything from rotational to regenerative. And even if those are <laughs> swappable terms and some say they're not and kind of what the difference is. So I think what we'll see kind of emerge in the marketplace over the next year or so, as this becomes a lot more just a relevant because of carbon market developments and relevant because of consumer demands for higher quality products is a lot more clear guidelines around what does it mean to have a regenerative operation? Uh, there's some kind of big folks with Cargill is doing this now. Applegate is running some experiments now. There's a, a million other ranchers too, and uh, some kind of big kind of nonprofit organizations that are trying to kind of build standards around this. So our theory behind it all is that regardless of, of who kind of wins the race to the first certificate, uh, it's all going to come back to rancher data, rancher data and record keeping, right? It's, it's, can we start with, hey, I moved my cattle this many times I had this many rest days and here's the impact to my land um, and every certificate that we've seen kind of in beta and everyone we've talked to so far it goes back to that data so even if you're if you're thinking to yourself you know what are my first steps to either be regenerative or if i really want to kind of dive into that ecosystem and maybe take advantage of the carbon credits markets how do i get started be it a, a, techno, a technological tool like pasture map or, or farm os or what have you or just a, <laughs> the savory kind of record keeping uh, printout, the PDF I'm sure you all can imagine, um, where you're just filling that information out and have and detailed record keeping. Um, that is honestly the, the key for a step uh, for, for every single standard I've seen is just, can you show where your cattle have moved over the past couple of years and what the impact to your land has been because of that, all right? And then the other things coming are scalable region and, and carbon validation through satellite imagery. I already chatted about that, but I just, cannot emphasize enough how much I think that's gonna kind of impact the industry in a world where there are kind of tests going on now that showed it could be as soon as a year to two years from now, 
I don't want to say solar tests will be a thing of the past, but significantly reduced costs, significantly reduced time because you're doing less of them. Um, and that's the, kind of the second piece of, of validation, right? Is I hey, I've got my movements. I know where stuff should be better and better sequestered. So now I can be it do a snapshot from the sky or do significantly fewer tests to get that to say, no, I, I can show you how much more carbon is, is in my soil. Um, other things that uh, are kind of on, are on the horizon that I think will be kind of interesting to see in the future are kind of more robust animal inventory functionality and kind of smart tools, if you will, or the, the IoT or Internet of Things of ranching tools. So um, there's a lot of these out here, but to just for the sake of an example, like Vence.io is a virtual fencing company or smart collars. Uh, but the whole concept is you know, ranchers know and have it documented, right? They have raising management plans where cattle should be moving. Uh, but what you typically have to do now is go paddock to paddock and say, you know, you're not counting every single cattle, granted, depending on the size of your operation, but you're getting at least a sense of, okay, I've got, you know, X amount of head in, in, in paddock 86 for the day. And you have to go send yourself or a mansion out to go confirm that and make sure they move and open the gate. Or even if you're on smart gates, you're still checking to see stuff is moving in between them. And I think the next piece of validation is all just augmenting the data collection you're already doing, right? So it's it's smart tags that are kind of showing where your cattle are at all times. So you don't have to be the one to go out there and actually see where the herds are. It's gates that when cattle cross through, it alerts you, right? It says they've already moved over. So I think we're seeing a ton of folks with really cool and exciting technologies that we're kind of partnering with out of, out of open team or integrating them into pasture map. But but the core uh, is kind of the way we've seen it and the way we see this industry evolve is ranchers right now have like a hundred data points, probably more that they're trying to track every single day um, to kind of validate that they're doing regenerative practices. And some of it's because they want to be regenerative and kind of take advantage of emerging environmental service markets and kind of really invest their time into that. And on the other half of it, it's just in order to be a great regenerative rancher or rotational rancher, you have to know a lot of this stuff anyway, right? You have to know, your grazing plan. You have to know how many cattle are in your paddocks at any one time. You have to know your rest days. So the trick and, and how I really think this market's going to evolve and what you should be kind of investing your time in aren't tools that tell you what to do, right? It's not that you don't know how to run your ranch. It's you have to collect a lot of information right now on a whole bunch of variables. So wouldn't it be nicer if you could focus on the ranching aspect because you, you know the best practices, right? But it's it's a whole lot of work to log all of that and track all of that in one spot. So the tools that I think are really gonna be kind of cause the forefront of validation and allow you to be environmental kind of service markets and, and carbon credit markets and all these other kind of core benefits that come out of regenerative agriculture that people are talking about is by doing what you're already doing and finding tools that capture that and log it for you and let you say, no, I know what I'm doing is right. Here's the data to validate it. And it does it for you, right? As stuff moves through, there's, there's smart tags that auto upload animal information. There's GPS tags that are getting developed. There's stuff that will pull in your rain data. There's stuff that logs your um, forage levels. Uh, and it's a lot of the stuff that you're already kind of tracking in the back of your mind. You kind of have an idea of how many rest days you should have. So the trick is, okay, now that you've got the hypothesis of what you think is the best, you know, run it through this tool that can crunch the data for you and say, you know what, I could probably graze an extra day or two here. And here's the impact to my ROI, right? Which is like, what if you go see like a ranching for profit course or a lot of the folks in the industry that a lot of the debate isn't about best practices when it comes to validation. It's, you know, how do you squeeze the most out of your land? And I think that's all through, and a lot of the tools we're looking at that are super exciting. It's not through telling you how to do it better or telling you best practices. It's, hey, you're, you're already doing the hard part. Um, here's the data behind it so you can start trying new things and hypothesize on how you can maybe get more from your land. So with that being said, I think um, that in our kind of in my world, and uh, I hope that gave a, a cool example of why we chose Pasture Map as our kind of first investment and kind of some examples of where we think the future of validation is for regenerative agriculture. Um, in summary, I would say it's it's very exciting to be in this space. I think it's really turned into there's a whole bunch of data points that ranchers are collecting now, and it's going to be awesome to see how we can empower them to get all those data points in one place and kind of leverage the power of technology and get it off of the old Excel sheets and it's something a little bit more 
powerful and let them leverage that data themselves to make those better decisions. And once they've got that, they can say, look, I've, I've validated my efforts because I know regenerative best practices and I've got the data to showcase why I'm using it the best way. Um, but no, thanks again for uh, letting me chat with you all today and happy to answer any questions or, or dive more into uh, what we've seen in the space or other kind of cool technologies we've seen being developed. All right, thanks, Nick. So if you have questions for Nick, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A or the chat box there. I see there's been quite a little bit of chat going on with Colin and uh, I hope you got all those questions answered there. Um, would like to remind you again that for next week, we will be breaking into four discussion groups. And again, Jason will be sending out an email with four different links. And you can select which of those that you would like to participate in. And Again, keep in mind that those are really gonna be an informal discussion where we would like to walk away with some ideas on how the Western Cover Crops Council can help you by doing research, doing demonstrations, doing educational programming, those kinds of things that will help you, the producers, with challenges that you're facing with cover crops. And I say, you know, even the Pacific Northwest, but there's huge variability in the in the climate and whatnot in the Pacific Northwest. But um, we look forward to having a bit more informal discussion with you next week. Um, when we close out today, again, there will be another survey and the survey is on today's program. And we really appreciate your input on that to help us better our programs. Um, would like to Kind of put on your radar there will be a little bit more information coming out soon and we'll email it to everybody but the uh, pacific northwest sub-regional conference will be starting in february and it'll be a similar format but really focus more on sort of the maritime area of the pacific northwest which would be uh, the western parts of washington and oregon and even northern idaho uh, a little bit more there as well so be on the lookout for that so with that, I would like to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, check the chat real quick. I don't want to close this, close this out while we have some discussion going on here. Jason, is there anything that I've missed that you would like to add for next week? Nope, just watch for the email and uh, you'll get all the information and the details to uh, sign up for that next one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, with that, it looks like there's nothing in the Q&A. And some emails. And again, as we close out here, if you have some additional questions, you can um, send me an email at the Jerome County Extension Office. My email is very easy. It's shines, just like the word shines, at uidaho.edu, and I'd be happy to pass those questions along. So with that, thank you for joining us on our third conference, and we look forward to visiting with you all.